Hi, hello, and welcome to Program Analysis. In this lecture, we will look at symbolic and concolic execution, which are techniques for generating inputs to execute a program without needing a human who is providing these inputs. Um, in contrast to the techniques that we've seen in the last lecture, which was on random testing and fuzzing, um, we'll now look into a white box test generation technique, which actually looks into the program and tries to um, analyze this program in some detail in order to find inputs that will execute some new behavior in the program. Here's an overview of what we're going to do in this lecture. So the lecture consists of four videos. Now we're in the first one. And in this first um, video, I will give an introduction of what symbolic execution actually is and give an overview of um, what I call classical symbolic execution, um, which is kind of the pure form of doing symbolic execution. Then we'll talk a little bit about what challenges this pure form of symbolic execution is facing and look at one approach called concolic testing that addresses some of these challenges in an effective way. And then finally, in the last um, video, we will have a quick look into some of the larger scale applications of these techniques and practice. Everything I'm saying here is based uh, on research papers. And in particular, I can recommend the three papers that you see down here. So if you're interested in some more details on the techniques that I'm describing here, you should have a look at these papers because they describe them in more detail and also provide um, a lot of more examples and um, empirical results than I do here. Let's start by having a look at what symbolic execution actually is. Symbolic execution is a technique to reason about the behavior of a program by kind of executing it with so-called symbolic values. These symbolic values can be thought of as placeholders for the actual values, which may be associated with some information of what the actual values must look like, but they are not as concrete as the normal input values that you would feed into a program. So instead of feeding maybe three and five and 26 uh, into a program as an input, we will reason about these inputs symbolically and just give them a symbol. And then while we reason about different executions of the program, um, impose more and more constraints on these, um, on these values. This idea of symbolic execution um, is pretty old, at least in terms of what old means in computer science, because it has been proposed by King and then refined a little later by uh, Laurie Clark in the 80s. Um, and then it has been around for quite a while without really being that popular, but around 2005 it became um, popular and practical again because um, of some advances in a different uh, uh, subfield of computer science, namely advances in constraint solving. Specifically, um, there have been um, very um, um, yeah, impressive advances in SMT solving, and we'll see that this is actually uh, a critical component of this whole idea of symbolic execution. So whenever an SMT solver gets much faster, um, symbolic execution suddenly also works much better. And around 2005, the point was reached where um, the SMT solvers were fast enough to make symbolic execution practical. And then a lot of people got, got interested in this pretty old idea again. And nowadays, it's again a topic that draws a lot of attention. So before looking into the details of how symbolic execution works, let's just illustrate um, the idea of this technique using an example. The example is what you see here. So it's a function which happens to be written in JavaScript, but the language doesn't really matter. Um, any imperative language um, would work. Um, and this function is taking three arguments, A, B, C, which are the inputs to this program. So program here means a function. And then in the function itself, we have three local variables, X, Y, Z, um, which are initialized to zero. And then we have a couple of um, conditions that are checked on the way, which are always conditions on the input, so on A, B, and C. And depending on, on these uh, conditions, we may, for example, take this path here or this branch here where we are assigning minus 2 to X, or we may go into this um, branch here where inside we are checking another condition which may lead us into this assignment and that assignment. And at the end, there's this assertion which is checking whether the sum of x, y, and z is not equal to 3. And the question is, well, is it actually possible that this assertion is violated? So is there some path through this code where x, y, and z happens to be, um, um, yeah, if you sum them up, happens to be 3? Before looking into the symbolic execution of this function, let's at first have a look at a concrete execution of this piece of code, which is nothing really surprising. It's exactly what you would expect to happen when you concretely execute this piece of code. And in this concrete execution, because it's concrete, we need to have concrete values for all the inputs. 
So for this example, let's assume that A and B and C are all equal to one. So these are our concrete inputs. And then the program is executing and starts by assigning values to these local variables x, y, and z. So, and these are all uh, initialized to zero. Then we are reaching the first if, which checks whether A is true. A is one, one um, will be converted into the Boolean true. So the first condition is true. And therefore we are taking this first branch where we are now assigning minus two to x. Then we are reaching the second branch where we check whether B is smaller than five. B is one, which is smaller than five. So this is also true, which means we are entering this, this branch and we'll check the nested if, which is checking that not A and C is true, which happens to be false. Um, yeah, because A is one, so A is true, which means not A is false. So this whole condition uh, is also false. So we are not assigning anything to Y, but we still have this other statement in the outer branch where we are assigning two to Z. And then we are reaching our assertion where we can now sum up our values X, Y, and Z where we find um, that we have minus two plus uh, zero plus two. And this happens to be zero, which is not equal to three. And that means um, here our assertion check is successful and we have not found a violation of this assertion. So the concrete execution wasn't really surprising because you've concretely executed programs a lot of times. Let's now have a look at how the symbolic execution of this piece of code um, will look like. So in the symbolic execution, we again start with the input values, but this time we are not assigning concrete values to them, but we are assigning um, so-called symbolic values to them. So we start by saying that A is a0, where a0 is the symbolic value that uh, represents the initial value of a, so basically the input that is given to this function. And we do the same for b and c by also assigning um, b0 and c0 to them. So these values here um, are called symbolic values. Given these symbolic inputs, we are now starting the execution of the program. And um, as before, we will now assign these initial values of zero to X, Y, and Z. Next, we are reaching this first if, and now in contrast to the concrete execution where we are taking one of the branches, but not the other one, we will now consider both possible um, behaviors because we want to symbolically execute this program um, and while doing this, we will consider all possible behaviors, behaviors of the program. So we reach this um, branching point where we are checking a condition and this condition uh, is A in the source code. A currently has the value A0, so the initial symbolic input that is given to the program. So what we're checking here is um, whether A0 is true or false. This check can have um, two outcomes, either it's true or it's false. And then depending on um, whether the condition is true or false, we will or will not execute um, this assignment of minus two to x. So if it is true, then on this edge here, we are executing um, this assignment, whereas on the false branch, we do not execute it. Now, no matter whether we have executed this assignment or not, the next um, statement that we will reach in this program is the second if, where we are checking whether b is smaller than five. If we look at the, con at, at the value that B currently has, we see that it has the symbolic value B0. So actually this check means that we are checking whether B0 is smaller than five. And this happens both in the case where we have taken the first branch and in the case where we have not taken this first branch. And again, because this is um, a Boolean check, there are two possible outcomes, um, uh, true and false. In the case where this check is false, we are at the end of the program because um, apart from the assertion statement, which I'm omitting here now, um, nothing will happen. So basically we will not write anything else here and here because we are 
at the end of the program if this uh, second if is false. If this check returns true, then we are going into the nested if, which means we will have to um, do another check. And now expressing the condition of this other check, um, again, in terms of the symbolic values, means that we are checking that not a0 and c0. And please note that I'm now um, switching to this logic notation instead of the programming language notation. And we'll see why I do this. Um, the reason is basically that we want to feed these um, logical um, formulas into a constraint solver later on. So um, in the case that um, this check is true, so again, we have these two possible branches here, two and true and false. And in case this check is true, we will execute um, this assignment of one to y. And then afterwards, we'll have this execute uh, this the second assignment um, of two to z and in case the check um, returns false we do not perform the first assignment but we do perform the second one so in that case um, this is the statement that follows and the same happens essentially um, in the other execution path which we have here on the right so if um, this check here returns true then we'll also check whether not a zero and C0, which again, may be true or false. And similar to the other side, if it's true, we will perform these two assignments. And if that check returns false, we will only do this one assignment here. Now this tree that I've drawn here, this is actually called um, an execution tree. because it represents all possible executions of this piece of code. And now one other thing we can do is to look at the different conditions that must hold in order for us to take a particular path through this program. And we can do this by basically starting at a root and then going to, down to one of the leaves and uh, concatenating all the um, conditions that we see on the way with a logical end. So let's, have, let's do this here for this first path that at the end ends here. So in this case, what we'll see is that the condition for taking this path is that a0 is true and b0 smaller than 5 is true and not a0 oops, and c0 is true. And now if you look at this um, condition closely, you'll see that there's a contradiction in it because it can't be that a0 and not a0 is true which essentially means that by just looking at these condition, we, conditions, we actually know that this path is infeasible. So it's not possible to actually execute this path with any um, input that the program could get. Now we can do the same for all the other paths and basically write down the conditions that must be true to take this particular path for each of those. Um, so let's do this um, also for the second path for which we need to have a0 and b0 smaller than 5 and and now I need to negate this condition up here so this will be not not a0 and c0. Now we can do the same for this path for example um, so we will take that path if uh, a0 is true and and now I need to negate this condition here b0 is larger or equal than 5. The same um, can be done for the other path on the right hand side of the tree. So for example, here we would have that not a zero because we're taking the false branch of um, this conditional here. And b zero is smaller than five because the second check um, returns true. And then because the last check also returns true, it's and not a zero and c zero. For this one down here, it's a little different. So here we have a0 and b0 is smaller than 5 and not not a0 and c0 and finally for the uh, rightmost path this one will be executed if we have not a0 and b0 is 
greater or equal to 5 because that's the negation of this second check. Now, in addition to the conditions that we now know for taking a particular path, we can now also for each of these paths look at the values that our local variables will have. And we can compare these values to what is actually um, uh, requested in this assertion. And if we do this, then what we'll see is that there actually is a path where we can violate the assertion. And this is um, the one that um, leads us down here. Because if we take this path, um, uh, z will be 2, y will be 1, and x will be 0, which means our sum is uh, 0 plus 1 plus 2. Oops. And this happens to be equal to 3, which means that our assertion is actually violated. And now because we also see from the condition that this condition can be um, fulfilled, so there are values for a0, b0, and c0, we actually know that there is an input to this function which will violate um, our assertion. All right, so now you've seen this idea of an execution tree on an example. Let me now define what this execution tree actually is. So as the name says, it's a, it's a tree. And more specifically, it's a binary tree. So basically, every node has exactly two children. And what this execution tree is representing is the set of all possible execution paths through a given piece of code. In this um, tree, we have nodes and edges. And the nodes, in this case, represent conditional statements. So for every branching point in the program, we have one node that represents the conditional that is checked at this branching point. And the edges. Um, of the node uh, of the tree represent um, the execution of a sequence of non-conditional statements. So basically everything that happens in between um, these uh, branching points. And then if you look at a path in this tree, then um, a path that starts at the root of the tree and goes down to one of the leaves represents an equivalence class of inputs that will lead the program exactly along the same um, sequence of statements. So as a little quiz or maybe homework um, for you, I have a, another piece of code here and um, I would like to uh, invite you to maybe stop the video at this point and just draw the execution tree for this given function yourself um, because it's, it's the best way to basically check whether you've um, understood this uh, idea of an execution tree. And then kind of as a, as a checksum, um, the question for you is how many nodes and edges does this um, uh, execution tree actually have? So please stop the video here and don't continue until you've done it. And then once you have done it, um, I will just let you know that the, the solution for this checksum is that there are three nodes and seven edges in this graph. I will not give you um, the um, concrete execution tree, but um, you're welcome to share it, for example, through Ilias um, once you've done it to double check whether your solution is correct. Apart from the execution tree, we've seen another concept in this example that I've shown. And this was this concept of symbolic values and of a symbolic state of the program. So the idea behind these um, symbolic values and a symbolic state is that all values that are unknown, so basically all inputs that, that are given to a piece of code, are kept symbolically. So everything that comes, for example, from the user or is read from a file, so where we do not really know by just looking at the source code what the value will be, is kept symbolically and is represented as a symbolic value. And then while the program is executing on these symbolic values, um, we have this idea of a symbolic state, which maps the variables in the program to some combination of the symbolic values, which represents the state that these variables will have um, when the program is executing. So looking at this example down here, um, where we have just a simple function that takes two arguments x and y, and then does some computation on these, on these arguments, we would consider the um, input values x and y as something that needs to be handled as a symbolic value. So we would call the initial values that x and y are having x0 and y0. And then we um, would, for example, do this computation here, which adds these two symbolic values and writes them to this local variable z. And we would represent the value of this local variable z as a symbolic state, which in this case would be the sum of x0 and y0. Just note that um, x and x0 are not the same. So if somewhere in here, for example, we would now assign some other value to x, which we could, of course, do, let's say x plus 1, then the 
uh, symbolic state of x would be x0 plus 1. So x and x0 do not have to be the same, but x0 is just the initial value um, of, um, uh, yeah, of, of a symbolic input. Given this symbolic representation of the inputs and of the state of the program, you can now reason about the conditions that must hold if a particular path in the program is executed. And this is done using so-called path conditions. So that's again a concept you have already seen in the example. So what I'm going to do here is just explain it um, and define it in a more uh, general way. So a path condition is essentially a quantifier-free formula over the symbolic inputs that um, represents all the branch decisions that have been taken up to the point in the program where we currently are. So for example, if you look again at this uh, piece of code here, then there is this condition that is checked here. And the question is what, um, what condition must hold for us if we execute these dot 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 statements here. And the answer is that um, the condition here would be that um, uh, x0 plus y0 must be larger than 0 simply because the check that we do here is on Z and Z as we've seen on the previous slide is the symbolic state that um, is represented as X zero plus Y zero. And here we are checking whether Z is larger than zero. So we get um, this path condition. So basically this um, is a formula that tells us what must hold in order to reach um, this, this branch down here. So now the nice property of these path conditions is that they are logical formulas and we can check whether a logical formula is actually satisfiable or not. And what this means is that we can check whether a path is actually feasible, so whether it can be executed or not, by just checking if the path condition is satisfiable. This could be in principle um, be done by hand, but um, of course you want to automate this whole process of um, automatically testing a program through symbolic execution. So we need another piece of software that does this satisfiability check for us. And this piece of software is called an SMT or a set solver. Um, set here simply stands for satisfiability because this is essentially what these uh, solvers are checking. And, but in practice, you often want to not just reason about purely logical formulas, but also maybe reason about integers or strings in a program. And therefore, um, um, most people use so-called SMT solvers, which means satisfiability modulo theory, where theory just means that the solver also knows something beyond um, uh, pure logic. For example, it knows something about integers or strings. There are many of these um, um, uh, SMT or SAT solvers out there. Um, Z3 and JISIS and STP are just a few um, that are popular. And if you uh, want to try out some of them, um, um, it's, it's, they are relatively uh, easy to set up and you can basically feed some logical formulas into them and see if these formulas are satisfiable. Um, in addition to telling you whether a formula is satisfiable, what these solvers also do is to provide a concrete solution for the case that a formula is satisfiable. And concrete solution essentially means that for all the symbolic uh, values, you'll get a concrete value that if you put it into the symbolic value, will make the entire formula um, evaluate to true. So let's illustrate um, these ideas just with two examples. So let's say we are giving this formula here um, to uh, a solver where we say, hey, a0 plus b0 must be larger than 1, then it will tell you, well, of course, that's satisfiable. There is a way to make this formula true. And this is, for example, the solution where a0 is equal to 1 and b0 is also equal to 1. Of course, there's more than one solution, but this is just one solution that um, the solver will give you. The second example is this one down here, where we have this slightly more complex um, logical formula where we're saying a0 plus b0 must be smaller than 0 and at the same time we want a0 minus 1 to be larger than 5 and b0 should be larger than 0. And now if you look closely at this example you can figure out that there's actually no way of having a0 and b0 um, um, such that this entire formula is true and the solver will also find um, this for you and will tell you that this formula is unsatisfiable, so there is no concrete solution to make this formula true. So now you've seen um, all these ideas of an execution tree and uh, symbolic representation of inputs and the state of a program and then this solver-based way of reasoning about execution. So you may wonder, well, why do we need all of this? So what are the applications of this symbolic execution? And um, there are many, many applications actually. And the general goal of all of them is to reason about the behavior of a program 
by not just executing the program, but by simultaneously reasoning about different paths that might be executed in this program. Um, this has a couple of uh, basic applications, which is what we'll mostly focus on here in this lecture. Um, for example, you can use it to detect infeasible paths. So you can rule out that particular path in the program can actually be executed. And even if an assertion would be violated if you would execute this path, if you see from the path condition that it's impossible to actually execute that path, then it doesn't really matter. Um, then, as we'll see, you can also use this um, to generate new test inputs. So because the solver can give you a concrete solution for a particular path condition, you can basically ask the solver, hey, what would be concrete inputs to trigger this path? And the solver will tell you. And this way, you're basically generating new test inputs that are guaranteed um, to take a particular path. And then by doing all of this, um, you can basically use symbolic execution to find bugs and also vulnerabilities by encoding what would represent a bug, for example, as an assertion, and then using this idea of symbolic execution and constraint solving to find inputs that would violate an assertion. And this um, then, of course, means that you've found a bug. Beyond these um, uh, basic applications, which is what most people use symbolic execution for, you can use this general idea of reasoning about the behavior of a program for, for other applications as well. So for example, um, there is work on generating generating program invariance based on symbolic execution, where you basically want to find out properties that must hold at particular points in a program. Um, you can also try to prove that two pieces of code are equivalent. This is um, an inherently hard problem, but um, with symbolic execution, you can, um, at least in some cases, do this. It's also pretty useful for debugging. So if you have a bug and you want to find out when and why this bug is triggered, you can basically try to encode the conditions for triggering the bug um, through symbolic execution. And this can then also, for example, guide um, something called automated program repair, where um, an automated technique tries to find a way to change the code in order to fix a bug. So here you would basically um, know that if this condition holds um, the program is in a buggy state. So let's change the code so that it's impossible to reach this particular condition while still maintaining the behavior that is uh, triggered when other paths of the program are executed. All right, and this is already the end of uh, video number one in this lecture on uh, symbolic and concordic execution. So we've now looked at classical symbolic execution and uh, you've seen some examples of how this works. And you've also learned about the underlying concepts like the execution tree, the path conditions, and this idea of a constraint solver in order to find inputs that make us take a particular path in the program. In the next videos, we will look into some problems of this overall idea, and then we'll also have a look at how these problems can be addressed. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.